God likes to, torment's not the right word, but sometimes he likes to take his time in giving me a message. And this was definitely one of those times. Has anyone here been skydiving or bungee jumping? I know Joan has. So Joan, I've got a few questions for you. 10 out of 10, 1 out of 10, you enjoyed it, right? Skydiving, bungee jumping. Um, 5 out of 10. So a 5 out of 10 reads you probably wouldn't do it again, right? Okay, so then would you two try something called land diving? No. No, okay. it's not like cliff diving where it's clearly you're diving off a cliff. It's land diving. It sounds safe and pretty uh, comfortable, right? Solomon, can we get the picture up? This is land diving, and uh, part of the picture is obscured for a reason, and we'll get there. Land diving or Nongol as it's called in its tribal language, is a tradition of the Vanuatu tribe in the Pentecost Islands in the South Pacific. So men will jump off this wooden tower anywhere between 60 and 100 feet off the ground with only tree vines wrapped around their ankles. Still, uh, still interested, Joan? It, it gets better, just wait. I'll convince you yet. So this land diving is done without any other safety equipment except for the vines around their ankles. Now this tower takes between two to five weeks to build, and it's not a permanent structure. Every year they build it and take it down and rebuild a new one. Now it takes about 20 to 30 men to construct it. The men will clear trees to construct the body, they will clear the site for the tower and remove rocks from the soil. It is built at the top of a slope, but you know, it's still, it's a little bit of, leering to look at. Now several platforms, don't know if the picture shows that very well, several of the platforms will you know, come out at about seven feet in front of the tower, the lowest platform, being at about 30 feet, and the highest platform near the top of it about 100 feet. During the jump, the platform supports snap, causing the platforms to hinge downward and absorb some of the force from falling. So, you know, it's not as scary as it looks yet. Yet. Now, these vines are selected by a village elder and matched with each jumper's weight without any sort of calculation. The elder will look at you, see that you're maybe 150 pounds, you should try this vine. That's all that's involved. Now, if the vine is too long, this is where it's going to get sketchier for you, Joan. If the vine is too long, the diver can hit the ground too hard. If the vine is too short, then the diver can miss the ground and collide with the tower. Like any other ritual or tradition, this is not for recreation. This is not a pastime for these people. This land diving ritual is associated with their annual yam harvest. So Nongol, this land diving, is performed every year. A good dive helps ensure a healthy and bountiful yam harvest, and it still gets better. The ideal jump is when a person who jumps, they brush their shoulders and head against the ground. The higher the jump, the more bountiful the harvest. So I've totally sold you against this, haven't I, Joan? Okay. The villagers believe that land, that land diving can also enhance the health and strength of the divers. The successful dive can remove illness and physical problems. And not only that, for boys, land diving is a rite of passage. At the age of about seven or eight, the boys can participate in the ritual. When a boy is ready to become a man, he land dives in the presence of his elders, and his mother holds his favorite childhood item. After completing the dive, the item is thrown away, demonstrating that the boy has become a man. So, just to sum this all up in a second. Tower build out of sticks and vines. An elder looks at you with no engineering degree whatsoever, says, this vine's the right vine for you, and you're to jump and hit your head on the ground. All that to bless the harvest. You know, I love sweet potato fries, but not enough to, uh, you know, engage in that. So this looks risky. It looks 100% risky. 
You know, and they do this without the modern amenities that we're used to. And, uh, you know, and their lives are in the hands of this person who just guesses. I mean, it's probably an educated guess, but it's just a guess. Um, you know, and, you know, luckily, Joan, outsiders can't do this. We can go watch, but we can't participate. So from the outside looking at this tradition, it is scary. It's dangerous. Some might even call it irresponsible. But what seems wild and dangerous to them is culturally necessary. You know, and thinking about Christianity with an outsider's perspective can seem risky as well. First off, we have our Bible. The oldest recovered copy of the Old Testament is 2,700 years old. The stories, in the, in the stories recorded in the Bible predate the records kept. Many people believe that the oral tradition of information sharing is inconsistent. Themes about creation, worldwide flooding, plagues, you know, stories about giants, you know, warriors like Samson who had to rely on their hair for strength. To someone unfamiliar with the divine authorship of the Bible, it would be uncertain for someone to believe. And, you know, as Christians, we also were called to believe in the divine virgin conception. We believe in a human son of God. We believe that this man healed the blind, the physically disabled, that he raised the dead, and he raised from death himself. You know, it, it's not like we can, you know, we can go and see this and see that it, you know, someone might get a little bit hurt, but that it's safe. But we don't have the luxury to physically witness the dead being raised or Jesus raising from the dead himself. And there's the fact that being a Christian today in itself is risky. Being publicly Christian has seen 200 million Christians today socially disadvantaged, harassed, or oppressed. And thousands are executed every year. It's honestly easier to do nothing than to be a Christian. Not many people get killed or oppressed for doing nothing or standing for nothing. So why do we even bother then? When I was a kid, my parents would always, you know, especially when I, before I bought my own car, they'd always get me to look at everything, do the mask, do math, do a risk analysis. So we need to look at the costs and conditions of what it means to have faith or to not have faith. Um, my first piece of evidence I want to present is from Luke 9.23. Jesus tells us the cost. Jesus said to the crowd, If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. At the time, people didn't know what that meant. People did not understand that Jesus would literally take up his cross and die for us. But today we have that information and to subscribe to the Christian faith, we must give up our own lives to Christ daily and follow him daily. Lucky for me, you know, there's no cross-carrying involved because I'm out of shape, but, you know, metaphorically speaking, when Jesus carried his cross, he knew it was the platform upon which he would die. How does this translate to us today? It means that we need to understand that there may be a risk that we may die carrying on for the work that Christ started 2,000 years ago. Certainly, that's already happening in other countries. In Canada, the risks are not so violent, but, you know, government and pop culture is slowly trying to edge us out, and it's at the point where being a Christian is obscure and countercultural. So not only are we asked to carry our crosses daily, um, Paul says in Romans, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's ra God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So because there were so few witnesses to this event, and all those witnesses long since passed away, 
we need to have faith that this actually happened. History will tell you that there was a Jesus who walked on earth 2,000 years ago. There's no doubt about that. Many people describe him as a prophet and nothing more. There are people who will practice what's called the Baha'i religion. And the Baha'i believe that Jesus, along with Muhammad and their current prophet, Baha'u'llah, are just designated men chosen by a God to send a message to earth. But we have to believe that Jesus is the true Son of God. And so that's what it takes to be a Christian, but to continue being a Christian, um, there's so many more things we have to do. In Mark chapter 12, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you've heard me speak here before, you've heard me talk about this, this isn't easy for us. This isn't easy in a world where it's, you know, we're becoming more misunderstood, and, you know, it's definitely easier to treat people how they deserve and not how Jesus wants us to. We're asked to be different from the world, and that starts with loving God and loving the world, even if it's difficult. In the same world that persecutes Christians, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. You know, people dying for this is nothing new. It's been happening for 2,000 years. You know, a quick survey of Matthew alone tells us to be humble, hunger for justice, be merciful, be pure-hearted, to be happy in the face of persecution, to be a light in the world, not, and not to judge others. Jesus holds anger to be as bad as murder, wandering eyes as condemning as adultery. We are to turn our cheek to those who hurt us and go beyond that with generosity and love. Jesus even promises that the road to hell is wide and that the gates to heaven are narrow and the road is difficult. You know, and we get, to re- we get the privilege to read all of this through the Bible. Many people will cast shade for the reasons I presented earlier, but the Bible is one of the most reliable and accurate pieces of work throughout history. You know, people, I know many people who, you know, will quote Plato and Socrates. There have only been seven known copies of Plato's works found and 40 of Socrates. But the Bible has over 5,000 copies. And in John 1, if if we're to believe the Bible is 100% true, John 1, 1 tells us, in the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. While there were over 40 authors of the Bible, all completely strangers to one another, the divine hand of God penned this cohesive story through many different people. There's so much more what I would call that the, is the price of faith, you know, giving up our lives, carrying our crosses, being overall nice to people. It definitely sounds like it's easier to do nothing than be a Christian. It definitely is. You know, if I was here, I was trying to sell Joan land diving. If I'm trying to sell Christianity, I'm not doing a great job right now. (laughs) But, um, yeah, and it's all dangerous and difficult. But being faithless doesn't have a happy ending either. Or not either, it just doesn't have a happy ending, period. It's been said already that the road to hell is wide, the path to heaven is difficult, and the gates are narrow. But faithlessness is an express lane on the wrong road. Just as much evidence as, you know, the importance of having faith, there is as much about not having faith. Continuing on in Luke 9, Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You know, ask Aaron, I lose stuff all the time, guitar picks, my wallet, loose change. I hate losing stuff, and I'm lucky to have her find all those stuff. It's almost always in the dryer, but 
she exclusively does laundry, so she's always the person to find my stuff. Losing our life means we get to spend an eternity avoiding, oh, losing our life in simple terms we get, means we get to spend eternity in a painful inferno. You know, we all know John 3.16, God gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Paul warns us that everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's standard and the wages for that sin is death. There's a quote I once read a long time ago and it reads, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. In another part of Matthew, I love this story. There was a woman who had been suffering with an illness for over 12 years and I have to imagine that she was out of reasonable options. She was out of rational options. And she was physically, mentally, and emotionally worn out. Now, in her travel, she probably heard of this healer, much like many people did. And with nothing to lose, she goes to find this man. Not knowing if it's the truth, but she goes to find this man. And when she does find him on the other side of a mob of people, she fights through the crowd, desperate to touch his robes. And when she does touch his robes, Jesus, commending her faith, heals her. Having faith is hard. Not having faith, though, means death and suffering. Having faith may mean we suffer, but we're spared from death. And instead, in our corner, having faith, we have a heavenly father. We have a healer and a comforter. Part of this, like I said earlier, sometimes God just likes to make me wait a little while. I was ha sitting around a fire with a friend about a week and a half ago. And uh, we're all sitting around a fire trying to solve the world's problems, as we do. I don't think we succeed very often, but... We're sitting around this fire, and he doesn't open up a lot about his life, but he just out of the blue, he confessed to us that he has a wild fear of failure. So afraid to fail that he doesn't even take risks. Instead of taking risks, every life decision he's made up to this point has been a highly calculated or prearranged sure thing. What I want to know is, do you... In all of the big and little things, have faith like the woman who touched Jesus' robes. Do you have that faith before all your other options are exhausted? And, it's when, you're, and when it's your turn to tie your vines around your ankles and jump, will you jump? And if you're here on the fence about Christianity and God, we are the open door church. We are here for everybody. I hope I have done a good job of lessening the risk to being a Christian. Um, I want to call the team back up. When Jesus walked on water and called out to his disciples, Peter was the only one who walked out. And he was walking until he doubted. You know, the path is difficult, right? You know, and though Peter failed to continue walking on the water, Nobody else went with him. You know, and Peter failed that, and he failed again by denying Jesus in the time of the crucifixion. But he would go on to be blessed greatly for his faith. You know, we here, not only at the Open Door Church, but we're all one body of believers serving the one true God. And when we're called to walk on the water, can we all go together? Iron sharpens iron, as has been said here. And we as Christians need to constantly build each other up as we have to take our daily cross. We need to support each other daily. Thank you. Jesus, thank you so much that you are the only one worth following. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And with you, we have victory you have come to give us abundant life. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you, Jesus, have come 
to give us abundant life. And that is worth the risk, Jesus, as today we looked at following you and becoming 100% followers of you, Jesus, to lay everything else aside. And Jesus, we surrender ourselves to you. You are the one that we follow. You are alive. You are here. You are real. You give us the victory that we need for every day, Jesus. There is none other but you, Lord. You are the only one who died on the cross, who rose again, and who said, I will send a comforter, one who will draw alongside of you, who will be your friend, who will be the one to give you wisdom in every step of the way. He is that near, friends. He is that close. Whatever the situation that you face today, he is the one who is right by your side.